You're very welcome to the Irish Political Roundup with me, Roisin McClerick. Me, Paul Brophy. Roisin, we're delighted to be joined by John, John O'Heaney, who's an independent councillor, newly elected independent councillor on Tipperary County Council. John was elected to Tipperary Co County Council back in June uh, of this year, 2024. And John topped the poll in the, in the sorry, Cashel, Cashel Tipperary local election area with an incredible first preference vote of I have a correct, correct here, 2,534 votes, giving you a surplus of 971 wow. votes. Now, for anyone from the outside looking in, people would say that's a phenomenal achievement for a first-time candidate, but um, this isn't a, it, it, was, it wasn't an accident. John has over 15 years' experience working in his local community. Um, John qualified as a prim, primary school teacher and then went back into education and retrained as a in the area of health and safety and he set up his own health and safety business which he works at cur currently as well as being a member of Tipperary uh, County Council. John you're very welcome to the Irish Political Roundup. Thank you very much for having me Roisin and Paul I'm delighted to be here. Yeah so John 2,531 uh, number one votes which was back in, back in June which is only what two, two months ago uh, you must have been delighted to to receive that level of support for a first-time candidate in the Cashel Tipperary local electoral area? Um, I suppose, look, it's it's nice to look back on it now. Um, at the time, it was a little bit unprecedented and something like this never really happened as far as any of us can see um, in Tipperary politics. Normally, a vote like that would need to be accumulated over maybe two or three elections or four elections, you know, based on experience of candidates and the work that they've done in the area. Um, I would have a big interest in politics since I was a teenager. So I'd know the facts, I'd know the figures. And um, even I, I even surprised myself um, with with the level of support that was received. Um, so it's a little bit, it's a unique kind of a story. Um, I, I Many people have said it to me um, that, it, that it was the highest first preference vote ever of a first kind of time candidate yeah, in Tipperary, um, which I, I've yet to fully verify, but for any of the facts and elections and figures from other elections that I've seen, um, it seems to be the case, um, which is great for myself, obviously, but with that level of support comes um, a huge level of expectation. Um, there's a lot of pressure now on my shoulders because of such a mandate um, yeah. to have been given to me by the electorate here in West Tipperary. Um, but as you said, this looking at this on the outside, looking in, it looks as if, wow, this this chap has come from nowhere. Uh, he's got a phenomenal vote. Um, we had the largest number of candidates in the county in, a, in my district. There was 13 of us running um, in some districts in Tipperary. There was five seats and only six candidates contested. Um, so, you know, we were everywhere I turned, there was ex there was candidates in my area. So it was it was quite a battle. Um, so, you know, to get such a vote was fantastic. And I suppose I'm very humbled and grateful. I don't take anything for granted. And I'm a, a very much a hard worker. And I think the work I'd done over maybe 10 years, maybe even to even 15 years around the area, probably accumulated the vote that was was got then on the day. And what motivated you to run as a candidate and specifically specifically as an independent candidate? It's a good question. Um, my family, I suppose, going back to my granddad or great granddad would have had a background maybe in, in party politics. Um, like most uh, people in this state, you could trace your, your roots back to maybe um, Irish independence or even further than, back than that. Uh, most families in the state um, would have, come from maybe one or two different branches and over the years diversified into other parties but I was just heavily involved around the community for years and I've always been very independently minded um, I've set up do dozens of different projects um, around the community and been involved in lots of different fundraising events and things that have helped people practical projects that have actually worked and benefited people's lives and I was doing that myself and, you know, I'd go around and bring one or two people in on a project with me and then I'd move on to another project. And this has been going on for years. And I suppose it motivated me then to see that, I, you know, I was capable 
of doing things on my own without the support of a major party machine behind me. And, you know, obviously the people here in West of Prairie felt the very same. And that's, that's you know, why they, they gave me such a mandate, I suppose, back in June. And you said you've been involved in a number of projects, John. What, over the last uh, 10 to 15 years, what ones would stick out? Um, I suppose initially it was just joining committees as a teenager and maybe into my early 20s. I would have been vice chairperson of the local sports and recreation centre. And then I became chairperson of a prominent local soccer club. I was on my local GA committee. Um, at one stage there, I was on up to maybe 10 or 12 committees and they're in different parishes then. Yeah. So West Tipperary is very much a rural district. We have two main urban centres in Cashel and Tipperary Town, but they're, they're rural towns. They're towns that survive because the rural people work in them and shop in them. So we're, we're and they're, they're market towns, they're mart towns. Um, they rely heavily on the agricultural sector. So I suppose we're from a very rural area. Um, so the fact then that I was involved in committees spreading across myself between maybe six or seven different parishes um, was a huge benefit because I knew people in different parishes. Normally, if a person runs as a first time candidate, they look to nail down their own parish and maybe their neighbor. Yeah, that is true. You kind of you said, where's hope, your core area? And you just, yeah, you they'll know, hope for the best after that. Down. But my core area was 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 big. It was massive, really, I suppose, because I had a lot of work done in a lot of parishes over the years. And then I suppose my own educational background and working background, I worked as a school teacher for maybe eight or nine years in West Tipperary, in, in other parishes. So that got me to get to know parents and sports clubs in places like Cashel and places like maybe Tankers Town and places like that, that perhaps I wouldn't have been able to get to know these people um, if I hadn't been working in the area. So it was kind of a mixture, a, a, a big cocktail of um, different elements came together and created this, I suppose, success is the one for a better word. Um, and, um, you know, that's that's really the basis of it, really. It was just joining a lot of committees earlier in my my time in my teenage years and in, in my 20s and then going on then and establishing projects um, in the area I suppose um, I'm the director of the Southbury hospice movement but before I became a director and on their board of management I would have done a lot of fundraising projects for them a lot of high profile fundraising projects the hike for hospice with two other lads from the area we raised significant funds so that would have gained a, a big profile in the area um, and people were very appreciative of the, the generosity and the charitable nature of the event. Um, in recent years, I would have set up, uh, along with another friend of mine, a website here in Tipperary that encompasses all the, the, all the services that you might need in terms of addiction, uh, mental health, bereavement, suicide, domestic violence, it's all on, on the click of a button that was called Light, oh. it up, Light It Up Tipperary. So that was um, another big project that gained a lot of traction in the area. But there, it was a practical project to help people, much like the hike for hospice. It helped a lot of people. And then I suppose following on from that, I established another project called the Sightsaver Bus. Um, oh, there's right. huge, huge waiting lists here in the area for medical procedures um, in terms of cataracts, in terms of knee knee replacements, hip replacements, tonsil removals. So I engaged with a lot of hospitals outside the jurisdiction of the HSE in England, Scotland, Spain even, and, and Northern Ireland. And I created a very good link with the hospital in, in Northern Ireland in Belfast. So anyone on a waiting list here in the area, I can get them seen almost immediately and they don't have to right. wait on a waiting list. So that was another... Treat, treatment abroad, I think, is that what we call it? Uh, it's called the Northern Ireland uh, healthcare planned healthcare scheme, actually. So, um, uh, yes, it basically the, the HSE reimbursed the money. You don't have to wait on a waiting list for three or four years, and it was a very significant project. But it's very practical. Everything I do is practical. It helps people. Mm. There's no agenda to it. It's just this is what's needed in the area. I yeah. set up this project based on it, and it takes off. 
So I suppose all of those things over the years accumulated. I, I, I would imagine I wouldn't be saying this if, if I didn't believe it to be true, but I think I had more of a, a background and more, more groundwork done than any candidate ever had done. And that's why, you know, that's what happened then with, with the election. The work had been done over 10 years, really, without fully realizing it. Um, I was working away in the background for years before I even decided. I mean, I only decided last summer I'd run in the election. But I suppose perhaps there was it's been building for years without myself even realizing it, you know. And I'm curious because, it's you know, that people say you ha in politics, first time elected with such a high number of personal preference, number one votes overnight success however you said you've been working on this since you were a teenager since you were actually you say 10 years um but when you think about it you're a teenager and you started being very sounds to me you're a real community activist working with community politics i'm really intrigued to find out when you were a teenager what was did you come from a political background or what got you interested in politics because nowadays young people have no interest in politics. Yes, that's correct, uh, Roisin. I found that on the campaign trail. The amount of young people that are not registered to vote is is unbelievable. Um, people in their 20s, up into their 30s, they have no interest in what's going on. They're just happy to live their lives and they don't think for the future or they don't see that decisions are being made around them that in, impact them. Um, and I suppose I was just very conscious of that from an early age. My grandfather, I suppose, would have had a big interest in politics. There's no record of any politician either side of my family on my mother's side or my father's side dating back 150 years. You know, so there's no there's no one that I ever had had um, advice to take from or anyone to look up to. Um, but my grandfather was was a good good influence I suppose he had an interest in the area and he had an interest in the community and he passed away in 2010 so I was lucky I had um, 19 20 21 years of him in my life and then um, he, he probably spurred my interest in, in politics listening to his stories of campaigns that took place back in the 1940s and 1950s and it was just, you know, as a child sitting there listening to it, obviously I absorbed some of it and it kind of, he would have been someone, I suppose, uh, Paul O'Heaney was, um, I suppose, an influence if if that was something to look at. Um, other than that, really, either side of my family, they'd, they'd be very, they'd be very good community people. They're very, very caring nature and a lot of people. And uh, But there was no major in interest in politics per se. So I do think I, I'm more of a community activist that is now after turning into a politician. But it was because of the amount of community work I had been doing. I just felt politics was the next, was the next step. Um, I think that there's a very famous quote, or I heard a quote from, I think it was Pope Benedict or Pope Francis. And he said that uh, politicians are, let's say that, that they're, God, I can't think of the quote now off the top of my head. <laughs> It'll um, come it, to you later. Don't worry about it. <laughs> he was just saying that, you know, that their their community involvement, you know, they're, they're really kind of the upper echelon of being involved in the community. You know, that this that their values, however much they might deteriorate as they get on in politics, but ultimately they got into it for the right reasons. Um, yeah. and it was very much that they wanted to help the community that they were involved in. And I suppose that's similar to myself. I wanted to help people in West Tipperary. And I felt I was at the maximum of being on committees. I, I had done as much as I could do being chairperson of a committee or treasurer or secretary of a committee. So the next step for me then was whether I would help people on, on a larger scale. And I feel I have the capabilities to do so. So that's what prompted me to run, I suppose, for the local elections. I feel I can now help the local community on a larger scale than what I had previously been doing um, on a smaller scale with, with local committees. Lovely. Oh. It sounds like, sorry, Paul, it sounds, no, it right. sounds like you are a real community person working for the community 
for the community, bringing politics back to local people, local grassroots, and being the local politician with the people in the community at the forefront. Yes, I suppose that's correct. Um, I made no promises on the campaign trail, which I think was very refreshing. Every door I knocked at, people said, well, what are you going to do for this area? And I, my first answer was absolutely nothing. And they were blown away by this. They were like, you know, a very blunt, honest answer. I said, I, I won't promise you anything. What I will promise is if I am elected, I will work hard for the community. I'll roll up my sleeves like I have been in the last 10 or 15 years. And I'll do my very best. And that was it, because that's the trap politicians fall into. They promise too much. They don't deliver on it. And then by the time the next election rolls around, you're known for not keeping your promises. Mm. People can't put yes. that on my shoulders because I've promised nothing to anybody. Yes. I've just promised that I'll work hard for the area and for the community going forward. Um, and that's what I intend to do. That's Under lovely. Promise and over deliver. Yeah. That's lovely because, you know, I've been really thinking about you get all these political parties and they're saying, if you want change, vote for us. However, they're, they're, they're bringing in the change that that political party wants to bring in, not the change or the, or the issues or values that the local people want. It's all focused on their political PR campaign and not for the community, what the, the change the people want within their communities. That's very correct. And I think you see it's very evident in certain places in the country now that there's lots of independent uh, councillors mm -hmm. being elected because these are ultimately the people that have been on the ground working over the last, you know, how ma however many years. And I think party politics in this country is, I'm not saying it's dying, but it's slowly shifting towards people would rather somebody in the area that they know will actually do something for their area and that they're not being totally influenced by decisions that have been made in Dublin from some party executive that have no, um, you know, they've no connection to Tipperary, for example, but that mm. yes, they're making decisions at an executive level in Dublin that are influencing people in Tipperary. Um, in this district, there are seven seats in the Cashel Tipperary electoral area. And two independents were elected this time out of the seven. Um, one lady actually had been independent, but she went with Sinn Féin then before the election. So, you know, Tipperary and is, is turning into very much an independent um, county. Yeah. You look at the national politics here in the county, we have had a couple of very high profile independent TDs for the last number of years as well. Um, so... Party politics is at much, very much a crossroad in Tipperary going forward, and I would be yeah. very interested to see what happens in the general election coming up. Well, you know, uh, there's 30 counters on uh, Tipperary County Council, and 14 of them are independent. They're the biggest group, if you were to pass them all as one group on Tipperary County Council. Now, some independents, they work together. Some independents do their own thing. Um, um, and then you have this independent Ireland party, which is they say it's a party or an alliance or something that's trying to bring independence together. Um, what what do you make make of all these um independent groupings that are starting to to uh, emerge? Well, that independent Ireland grouping, I've no connection to them. Um, I see what they're doing, and they see you know they've they've gained a lot of traction. They've got a lot of high profile TDs. Um, backing their cause they gained quite a few um, council seats in the last election so it'll be interesting to see if they can push on um, and maybe gain a couple of extra TDs in the general election coming up um, would make for very interesting numbers then as regards who will hold the balance of power and what way things will go um, it'll be an interesting general election I'd mm. imagine Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael will probably stay together in their pact. And if they do, nothing will change. Um, I couldn't see. It would be highly unlikely that such a, a change would take place that um, one of or either of them would be would be wiped out to such an extent that and have a brand. 
that the next general election has been split again into North and South Tipperary. And I think you probably will be in the North, Northern part of the... I'm actually in the South, would you believe? The South part. So, sorry. Um, would, does running for national politics interest you or are you just solely focused on your work on Tipperary County Council? That's a very good question. Um, I suppose up until the local election results, I was very much focused on West Tipperary and what I could achieve in West Tipperary. But I suppose there's a lot of issues here in my locality that cannot be solved by a local councillor. Um, Tipperary Town has major problems in terms of infrastructure, in terms of employment, um, as do other towns in the, the district and in, in South Tipperary. And unless we get a high level and a high caliber of candidate in Dublin, um, helping to influence and shape what's happening down in South Tipperary, nothing is going to change. So I suppose my focus, although very much community-based here in West Tip, I have one eye now on national level as well because you know, I'm encountering difficulties every day that just are not going to be solved at a local level, no matter who the candidate is. Um, so in, in South Tipperary, the next time um, we have an extra TD. So we're losing three out of our five TDs, current TDs up to the north, and we're left mm -hmm. with two in the south. Um, so we have Matty McGrath and... Martin Brown are the two that we have currently here and we will have an extra TD then. So it's very much an open, South Tipperary is very open the next time I feel, I do feel right now I can, I would probably, probably predict two out of the three, but there's a very, there is a big opening for a third, third candidate there for the next time. Absolutely. And of course, the new North Tipperary constituency also takes in a bit of Northwest Kilkenny, but we won't delve into that. To <laughs> oh, I'm not sure if anyone is happy about that. The Tipperary yeah. people are the Kilkenny people. It's it's a strange yeah. the Orlingford and places like this brought into into Tipperary. Um, you know, really a county should be kept, you know, yeah, on their own. Absolutely. I think because you know there's too much. You know, it's it's a long way from. Nina all the way over to parts of Kilkenny so and they're all going to be in the same area it's or from Lara above a north tip near the Galway what? border down to Kilkenny it's 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 a strange one I know it probably went on politics and geography and different things but mm -hmm. you would imagine Tipperary should have just been kept as Tipperary and Kilkenny yeah, Kilkenny yeah. is just Kilkenny Carlow usually the same correct yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, so. I just know that you. I was laughing to myself when you were talking about Kilkenny and and, and Tipperary. A lot of people in North uh, Kilkenny could be singing the songs a long way from Tipperary, from my TD office or something like that. <laughs> you know. Problem, yeah, you, you need to feel connected to who yeah. you're uh, and at a local level here. I suppose another thing that was a positive impact on me was my parish and the parish beside me so I'm living right on the border between two parishes and my dad was from one parish and I'm living in the other yeah. parish so none of those parishes had a, a councillor for a long long time maybe right. 15 20 years so they wanted somebody so that's in, that was a positive impact on me now we're very oh, yeah. two very small yeah. parishes but having two small parishes is better than having no parish helping you so um I do. And what parish we, 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 are you in? I'm currently sitting in Latin Cullen and I'm only about 100 yards from Emily. So um, oh, um, my, my, dad, my dad, my dad grew up on a small family farm in Emily. He was and he just we he built a house then um, over the border. So I'm just here in my parents house uh, this morning. I was I was helping at home this, this morning. So. Um, I said I'd take the take the meeting here at home. Oh, um, no. Isn't that lovely? So you you grew up in a small family farm. Your your father had yes, a father farming had, background then. Yes, yeah, it was a uh, small uh, suckler farm. So I, I help out on the farm with my brother um, and my dad, obviously, would be running us then. So yeah, that's our back, very much a rural background, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, so I connect with my electorate because a lot of my electorate are from a rural background and they want to see that they've elected somebody that will resonate with them and 
that will bring their issues to the fore at council level, I suppose. Do you think the county councillors have any power anymore within the um, within decision making within local communities? That is that's a good question because a lot of the powers have been eroded from the county council, the county councillors as well, and a lot of the decisions have been taken out of their hands. Um, one huge problem I'm encountering is the water. Um, mm. I and water are now a different entity to the council. And at least years ago, your local councillor could inform you of when the water was going to be off, when it was going to be on, when work was going to take place. You know, now I'm getting a phone call at nine o'clock in the morning to say there's no water in Tipperary Town or Golden or, or Dundrum. And I'm as much out of the picture as the person ringing me so i have to go off and investigate it then and see what's going on and get back to them and there needs to be much more of a united ap approach it just seems as if irish water are gone off on a different tangent mm -hmm. and but the problem is, is the, the local councillors are still you know taking the brunt of the questions when they don't have the answers sometimes yeah. um which is kind of which is quite frustrating um, yeah. and wa water infrastructure is, is really important as well for you know, of course housing is 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 a big is a big issue and you can't build houses without proper water connections and things like that so it, it really is you know an important thing um, and if you want people to live in rural Ireland you need one good quality water for for drinking and it's essential for living and um, also for you know People who want to live in rural Ireland, they need, they need a, a sustainable food supply. Well, they do. And, you know, a lot of the work that Irish Water do is very progressive. And, you know, um, the, it's essential maintenance, a lot of the work. But it is quite frustrating for local businesses and local councillors when it's it takes place at short notice or at times throughout the day that people would be at work or it's affecting businesses. And I think it's just lack of communication is the worst that yeah. people have yeah. to wear. And, you know, it's affecting hair salons, it's affecting local businesses, local villages. And, but, you know, as the local county councillor, I'm the person taking the phone calls mm. on it. Uh, whereas Irish Water is now a told it's more or less a different entity to the Tipperary County Council and similar situation across the country. So I do feel, and it was brought up in our first meeting, that we needed a more of a collaborative approach going forward because there seems, seems to be too much of a disconnect at the minute mm -hmm. between the two, even though the, the two should be working simultaneously. Yeah. I think before the last one, of before the, the local elections in Cork City Council or Cork County Council, there was... Um, a meeting and one of the motions was that the um this the Irish water should be disbanded or stuff like that. You know, some of these motions, you know, your yourself, John, people are just trying to get a bit of traction in the newspapers and stuff like that. But you talk to most county councillors that their experience of Irish water, Irish care, and as it's called now is um very mixed. It is and it needn't be if if um the proper lines of communication were put in place um I feel it, it would be much more streamlined service because the work they're doing is essential. A lot of they're doing a lot of hard work, but they're getting a lot of negative publicity. Um, whereas if if their communication um, communication sector communication wing was a little bit more open and in touch more with the local councillors and with the people on the ground that it, they're affecting. Um, that they wouldn't have as much negative publicity but slowly but surely they're turning the vast majority of people against them when they shouldn't be trying to do that they should be trying to work with people um, because people do understand that the work they're doing is essential and it has to be done and nobody's denying that but at some some stage you have to say look a little bit of notice would have gone a long way there instead of turning off the water supply to a village uh, which happened this week here in the area uh, and last week as well a different village and all the businesses to be affected over it mm. you know um there needs I mean, to you be think of that you've got the local businesses being affected that's the local economy 
Then you, you come from an agriculture background. What about all the farming, um, the needs for the farmers, for the water, small local businesses and the local economy? Yes, I just think, and it's something that's going to come to a head, I'd say, eventually, that the general public and the elected representatives are just not going to stand for it anymore. And something will have to be done that there's more more communication now they will say look we have a text alert system and we have we have a website and but it's very difficult you know you shouldn't have to be checking the website for irish water every morning yeah. to see you have water um so i think a lot of people in the locality would follow their local representative's social media accounts and if someone was to inform me on a sunday afternoon or or a monday evening that look there's going to be no water tuesday at least I could give people some notice and yes. put it out there to people and they could make other provisions or other plans. But at the minute, it just seems to be that, you know, in a lot of situations, the water goes, there's panic stations, you ring your local councillor, he or she isn't fully aware of the situation and it's just an unnecessary yeah, absolutely. But they need to and, improve their communication strategy from Irish Water to the lo all the, the local county council and the local county councillors and the TGs. Absolutely, yeah. That's what I feel needs to happen yeah. going forward. Um, common sense. Common sense approach, yeah. <laughs> common sense. Uh, excuse me if I look distracted. Behind me, I, I'm using my laptop. Behind me, my son's computer is there and we had problems so he rebooted it and in the it was going off and on my and then the what do you call it the hydrogen that went yeah. off and all things were going on in the background so sorry if i look distracted, distracted. Think, what if it blows up <laughs> technology is great when it when, when it works and john as you said you're, you're primary primarily based in a in a rural constituency um what are the big issues coming up? You know, as the water is obviously one, but you've spoken about the loss of Dundrum House as an amenity uh, in in the area which will come under you, yeah, the area you rep represent. Um, it's to become an IFAS centre. Um, yes, it is. I suppose Dundrum House was a renowned um, venue for many, many years under the Crow family for weddings and funerals and all types of events um, around West Tipperary. It has a fantastic golf course that have over 550 members. Um, there's a leisure center in the in the facility. Um, there's a restaurant. There's the capabilities for a lovely hotel. Um, and I suppose, look, I'm not against helping people where I, I'm in my situation. And I was elected on the back of helping thousands of people over 15 years around West. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So, you know, if, the, if these people are in the country, we're going to have to help them if they're already here. They're going to, but I just feel that closing down local amenities or the potential where local amenities can be in an area is, is counterproductive. <clears throat> you know, there must have been other solutions, um, other vacant venues, other vacant uh, buildings that could have been utilised. Um, so it really comes down to, I suppose, the owner of these particular places seeing the dollar signs, unfortunately. And there's a lot of money to be made, <clears throat> excuse me, out of turning your facility into one of these centers. Um, the figures would frighten you if I was to, I, I have the, I had them written down, myself and a few people actually done up the numbers on what. This, these in, individuals can make on a weekly basis. And you're talking hundreds, hundreds of thousands a week. Um, whereas they might be very slow to turn um, these amenities into IPAF centers or similar centers if they were only being offered the same price as a hotel room um, for the night or for the week. Um, I just feel in, in our area in West Tipperary, we only have four or five hotels and it's a massive area. It's the largest district in Tipperary in terms of an electoral area. And, you know, to lose one of the major amenities out of mm -hmm. our rural area here in West Tipperary going forward. Now, it, it, you know, it's it's just counterproductive. Now, the argument is, is that, well, it hasn't been used as a hotel in a few years because it's been housing the Ukrainian citizens for the last couple of years. 
And before that, it hadn't been used for a number of years either. But the potential was there. I mean, to try and rebuild this amenity from scratch somewhere else in West Tipperary will cost you hundreds of millions. Um, and we have the amenity in the area. And I think I, I had said it quietly to people that I had an idea. I didn't say it to too many, but I felt that there's an awful lot of monasteries and, and an awful lot of convents um, and that the Catholic Church possibly should have been approached. Mm. Um, I can think of maybe a half a, do half a dozen of them that are not too far away from me here um, and that are totally underutilized. Massive buildings with 50, 60 bedrooms in them and they're not being used. They might have one or two nuns in them or one or two priests and those were ready-made buildings for this these type of projects. And the government had come out and said, they're quoted as saying this, that they would not close down or that they would attempt to stop closing down local hotels and local amenities. Um, they only said this very shortly, very briefly ago, um, short time before the election. And here we are a few, few weeks later and, you know, they're ripping the soul out of a small parish in West Tipperary and, you know, I'm not saying that the that the hotel would have been up and running again tomorrow morning, but the potential was there for for it the. It could have been done. It could have been, have been re, yeah. re, refurbished, reused, and it brought back the local economy within the area through tourism. Yes, and I'm not as I local said, local and I'm, international tourism. Absolutely, because it was a renowned venue for um, golf trips. A oh. lot of people from Dublin, from the north of Ireland, from the west used to come down and spend the weekend in Dundrum House. It had a huge knock-on effect then for the local village, the shop, the local pub. Local economy, local all just economy, circulating. All benefited. It was a great employer in the area here. Um, there was dozens of, of local um, teenagers got part-time jobs. Mm. People worked there. They're saying that the, you know, the golf course won't be affected long-term and... I would I would have skepticisms over that. Um, once this centre is up and running, it'll be a permanent um, fixture. And, you know, I would worry for the long term viability then of the golf course and all the members there. And yeah. golf courses are really kept immaculate and they have to be maintained. Absolutely. They do. I know nothing about golf. Paul is a golf. Uh, yeah, you're you're talking fan. serious money to um, uh, maintain a golf course. That I'm a member of a golf club in Kilkenny, and the maintenance bill could be like massive, could be like four hundred thousand a year. So it just goes to show the level of work that's involved and mm -hmm. the level of people work for people working there as well. So if, as you said, if that golf course becomes um unsustainable, you know, there's like, there's more jobs and a threat there in the local economy. Absolutely. And look, I'm just, my whole focus is a community focus. I'm trying to keep resources in our area, not to lose them. Um, and trying to gain extra resources there last week, I've set up a campaign to try and get an earlier train time in Tipperary town. We're very lucky here in the area. We've actually two train stations, um, very close to us. Very few places in the country have them. Yeah. But in Tipperary Town, the service is totally underutilized um, because the timetable doesn't match up um, to people starting work down in Clonmel or in Waterford um, before nine o'clock if we had an earlier train. Um, so I set up a, um, a petition there about a week ago. I think there's about 500 signatures on it. Um, I'm going to try and do a... Um, a, a kind of a, another one as well that's not online so i'll walk around we'll, i'll do an actual physical one i suppose to try and get some more signatures for people who are not tech savvy and i'm going to present it to irish rail to try and maybe get one extra train that might leave at seven in the morning or half seven but it would take hundreds of people from our area who work in clan mel who work in waterford who have early hospital appointments in the area mm -hmm. college students in particular yes Tipperary is a massive feeder to Waterford College. My own sister is almost qualified as a nurse. She spent four years down there. She often, in her earlier years, had huge problems getting to college because 
the buses might have been going at she had a part-time job which didn't finish till maybe late on a Sunday evening so obviously then she might have been able to get the bus down and you know it put added pressure and financial pressure on my parents on myself on whoever had to drive her to Waterford or to drop her off at a friend's house who'd take her to you know whereas if there was a train running maybe at a correct time on early on the Monday morning she could have went down first thing Monday morning um and attended her lectures or whatever she had to do for the week in Waterford Again, that's common sense. That's common sense politics. It's common sense logistics. It's common sense. Well, there's no agenda to it. Anything I do, it's basically, can this benefit West Tipperary? And if it can, let's try and do it. If it can't, okay, let's move on. Can-do attitude. It's just a can-do attitude, really, yeah. So, I mean, you know, that's this month's project. Next month, I'll think of something else. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Years, yeah, yeah. It's, it's good. You're good to, here is the problem. There is the solution. How do we get from point A to point B? And I do think, and it's been said before, the Tipperary town is actually not too far from Limerick City as well. That's right. Yeah. Huge problems in Limerick City with student accommodation and the cost of it, and um, you know, actual actually finding it. There's a shortage of it in the city. Whereas mm. if we had the correct train service um, and the correct transport links, there's nothing stopping a, a, um, a college accommodation development happening here in West Tipperary. And, you know, if there was a, a very fast train service in it early in the morning, yeah. late in the evening, um, it could take a lot of pressure off of Limerick City and a lot of pressure off the colleges in there yeah. when children are be a- Parents it would be, be good for Tipperary Town as well. You'd have well, it you would, know, it would living in the area and, well, yeah. and money, money would be going back into the local economy because that's what we're all about. Now, that's a very long term plan because you know there's a lot of issues there with that. There isn't mm. the accommodation has to be built, or you know, you'd have to get the correct transport services in place. And I'm finding that they take a lot of time and a lot of effort just to get those things in place. So sl- local politics is a very slow moving machine. It's a slow burner and you have to have a lot of patience. I'd be the kind of person who likes to set up something on a Monday and see a result by Friday. But I'm finding yeah. that that's just not the case in local politics. And I might be waiting six months for an answer or two years for an answer, which I'm going to have to learn to to deal yeah. with going forward, unfortunately. But I think that's what people want. They want to be able to go to their local county councillor or their local TD with a situation or an issue that affects the whole community. They don't want it to take 15 to 20 years. It's like, you know, there's a lot of money within within the government. You know, are they putting the financial resources into the wrong places instead of putting it into the local community places, which will improve people's lives? Has John frozen? Oh. I think he's frozen. Johnny, oh. there, you back? Well, look, yes, that's true. Yeah, um, exactly. Obviously, there's certain budgets. Are you okay? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, we're back. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Yes. So I suppose, look, budgeting is a big problem as well. And there's only a certain amount of money to go around. I'm fully aware of that. And you know, I can't go in knocking down the door of the district administrator looking for money every Friday for some other project. His hands are tied. He's, you know, he's taking orders from other people. And I suppose you, um, you would want, like... The I'm talking person- about top level. I'm talking about government money and government funding, not local county council funding. Well, I suppose, look, what at government level... Like there's a lot of money been thrown at different problems in the country that have not been solved. The healthcare system is the example yeah. of this, that there is hundreds of millions been spent yearly. Millions. And I think the, the situation is getting worse. Uh, UL hospital would, would only be maybe a half an hour from myself here. The, the trolley waiting lists could be a hundred. There could be 150 on trolleys there some nights. I mean, how in, in this day and age is that allowed to happen? You know, practically, could they not just build on a massive wing, staff it with the correct staff, and we all move on 
I mean, that's... And pay the healthcare, the health, uh, the doctors and nurses and healthcare professionals, pay them like the defense forces a decent wage where they can afford to live. Well, that's it. We're losing a lot of our, 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 I suppose our trained, educated workforce. Yeah, they're gone to Australia, they're gone to America, they're over in London. Um, the incentive incentives for young nurses, especially to stay, yeah. just isn't there. My own sister is qualifying in a few weeks' time. She's already said it's that she she's going to do a year maybe here and she's gone. She's going to go to Australia because she's under huge pressure all the time. She's coming off a shift um, in Clanmel Hospital. It's totally understaffed. She's minding 20, 30 patients. Um, she's not being paid the correct wage because she's not qualified, even though she's doing the work of the nurse beside her or the doctor beside yes. her. And it's it's. It's a very bad start to these people's careers that they have such a negative association yeah. um, so early in their time um, in the health healthcare system in Ireland. Yeah. And then they leave and they go to brighter climates and maybe they're on more money and we're losing some of our brightest talents when we should be trying to retain them, especially in the healthcare system. Yeah. Seems My daughter's one of them. She flew off. She's a doctor, qualified as a doctor. She was a radiographer, went back, studied um, postgrad medicine. And um, she, she, last month, she went to Australia. So they, it's like all the cost of educating the, uh, the young people and, and health professionals. <laughs> and then they're, going, they're leaving the country. Yes, and that has to be looked at. There seems to be a lot of money gone to administration in the healthcare system. There seems to be a lot of people pushing paper and in offices and then on the ground where it matters most, you've got one or two young nurses, one or two junior doctors holding holding entire wards together. On yeah. their own. And it makes no sense then when you go upstairs and there's 15 people, you know, in an office or, or elsewhere. It's very top heavy where it should be the other way around. And John, are you into sport? You must be, especially if you got two over two thousand first one uh, preferences votes. Uh, yes, I, yeah, I love sport. Girl. Always had since I was, I suppose I was very heavily involved as a as a child and a teenager in sport, and I would have have been quite a keen Gaelic footballer and athletics. They were my two big things when I was growing up. Um, and I was lucky enough to to play both and to a very high level um so i was on different underage teams with tipperary and football and i would have represented tipperary in athletics in as a teenager i hurt my knee then when i was about 24 or 5 oh. that kind of put um i never fully came back from it but i suppose would i be sitting here today if i had spent four nights a week playing hurling and football for the last few years um I wouldn't have spent four nights a week on committees and getting to know the locality. So, you know, things um, probably I wouldn't have had the maybe the mandate I got in the election if I hadn't. I wouldn't have had the time to put the groundwork in, you see, if I had kept up the sport yeah. side of things. I still try and retain some level of fitness, but obviously um, my community work is, is takes over really nowadays. Yeah. You sound like a real community man and a family man. Yes, yeah, that's it. Yeah, my family would be very important to me. I started off on the 1st of January with nobody on my campaign team. It was wow. just myself. And then by the by the elect day of the election, I had had 104 canvassers come out. What? With, um, and then oh. I was outside of my family. My family then helped me as well. So you had 104 canvassers outside your family? Yes, yeah, yeah, I did. Well, I say an awful lot of politicians and candidates want to speak to you about your success in that. I, yeah, it was just, I suppose, it's hard to really see how it happened because I never went out any night unless I had a local person with me that knew the locality that we were going to. So that I, and I had to sit down and think about this maybe on a Sunday, who do I know for Tuesday night in, in Bohar Lahan or Cashel? So I, you know, I just pick up the wow. phone and ring them and said, look, 
if I'm running um, as an independent candidate in the local election, would you like to come out with me? Um, and we'll tour around the area and, you know, meet the people. And I suppose it was a very nice approach. Sometimes politics is very heavy handed and mm -hmm. very, yeah. very, very, but I just put this to people that we're going to go around and chat to your, your local area. We'll see what the local issues are. And yeah. Every night I went out, then I had a new person in the car with me. And it was very, I was yeah. running empty towards the end of the campaign. And I think my canvassing team kept me going. Oh. I was out yeah. five or six nights a week, but I had a new person in the car every night. And All right. only for that, I'd say I was, yeah. you know. It, was, it, just, uh, it just goes to show, John, local politics is what it is. Very, very local. Because I, I know somebody who was canvassing and they said, who are you? Where are you from? I don't know you. And then he told him who he was and who they Oh, I'll take a leaflet off you there. No problem. So it, it, it just it, goes to show it is very, very local. It's but, very local. That, yeah. that is important too as well. As you know, local. local you have to be from the area. National issues and yeah. national issues affect local issues as well. So everything, it's all, it's all part of a cycle. It is, I suppose. I just my my campaign was based on very much hard work as well. Yeah, I seem to out. I, I outworked a lot of the other candidates. Um, you Must know, be with your with your two thousand votes. They, well, that why I say that is they said that to me after the election. They said, "Look, she's looking at it now. You put in such groundwork and such an effort. Um, that you know that's where the the success came from." I was out five or six nights a week since maybe the end of January to June. You know, a lot of the other candidates mightn't have started until March or April. Um, so you just have to be out on the ground, especially on your first time out. You have to put in the groundwork. Hopefully it'll be a little bit easier going forward if I stay in politics going forward. But, you know. I have a question for you. I'm curious again. Who would be your political influences then? Who would affect, who would influence your political um, I um ideas and um ideology? I actually got. I actually don't look up to anybody really. Um, Not look up to, but who would be your? Who would influence you? See, I'm, at the minute, I don't have any major influences because all I'm doing is going around the community, helping the community. So, so the community, the people in the community influences your political agenda. That's that's it. Yeah, that's that. In a okay. nutshell, the people of West Tipperary influence everything I do on a daily basis. Yeah. If so, if there's a problem in Hollyford next Tuesday night, which there is, and there's a meeting there, I will go up to Hollyford, which is maybe far, half an hour, 40 minutes from me, and I will see how I can help those people. Um, Don Drum, obviously, that was mentioned. I'll be there at some stage again soon. Um, I had major issues with the preschool in Bansha over the last eight or nine months, even before I was elected. And thank God we got good news on that yesterday. So I was helping, you know, so the community influenced my decisions. Um, I don't, I'm not influenced by any of the other TDs or any of the other councillors in the area. They can they're free to do what they want <laughs> and I'm happy to help them and support them if I can. But uh, the people of the area, the community are, are who I am influenced by. So that brings back to what I mentioned earlier on and what I tweeted about yesterday is a lot of politicians and political parties say, if you want change, vote for me. But the changes that they want to see implemented, but not the changes what the people in the community or their voters want, whereas you are influenced primarily by, and absolutely, from what I hear you saying, by the people within your community. That's very true. And I do think with the amount of independents that have been elected in recent times, that a lot of people are turning away from party politics, particularly younger people, I found, mm -hmm. um, in, in my own opinion, most people in their 20s and 30s now don't really don't really care as much for party yeah. politics like their parents did. Yeah. And parents, so, so. they're happy to vote for somebody that they see in the area, that they know, that they see who's working in the area, regardless of your background. 
Um, and that's very much came to the fore this time round, I think, and it probably will going forward. Party politics is having less and less of an influence. What does the future hold for me then going forward? Like, I mean, you know, do I at some stage do I have to join a party in order to have any real say in the area? At the minute, no, because I feel I'd yeah. have enough. Have you ever been approached? Uh, yes, I have. Before the last election, there was talks there of 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 maybe going with a party. I'd imagine now, after what happened in the local election, um, going forward, that there might be a few looking at me saying, well, this is someone yeah. we want to have on board with us. But at the minute, I have no great ambitions or no great interest. None of them appeal to me as much. Maybe they did when I was younger and impressionable and looking at these guys going, God, aren't they great? But now that I'm in it myself, I know that I can do the work myself. And I hate to jump in with a party and regret it. Yeah. Which I do feel some people do. Yeah. One particular person is coming to mind um, locally. Um, you know, they, they would have went from an independent state and an independent um person mm -hmm. to join a party and maybe perhaps it didn't work out and now they're maybe stuck with that party because people don't do not like you jumping around no you don't like people jumping from party to party you lose credibility you lose you know what does this person actually stand for so how i got elected was on the basis of my community involvement and people were happy enough to back me based on that and being an independent, people saw, well, God, he's done an awful lot on his own. Let's give him a chance. And five years time, it might not be the same. They might say, well, we gave him the chance and it didn't work out. But it won't be from a lack of an effort or lack of trying. I'll work very hard over the next few years, like I have been over the last 10 years, 15 years. And hopefully um, that resonates with people. Well, you certainly yes, sound like certainly. you were voted by, by the people, for the people. And that, that's how people saw you, that you were, uh, people voted for you because they saw you as a candidate for the people. Yes, that's what I think happened this time. Um, we had an awful lot of candidates in the area. There was all the big parties had major players in the area. Um, but I just feel that I had a huge amount of groundwork done. Mm. And, you know, I suppose things did fall into place as well you know the fact that i'm coming from a small little area that hadn't any councillor that was a, that was a good start um i had an awful lot done across maybe seven eight nine parishes which was you know unprecedented nobody had that kind of groundwork put in ever in in the history of temporary politics from north to south nobody had the level of work done that i had done um, and John, you're still very young. If you don't mind me asking, I, I would say a lot of viewers would be curious. Like, how old are you? Now, I know you're not supposed to say this, but I'm, I'm curious because I'm in my early 30s. I won't give away the exact age. Don't, because that brings me to my next question, which we spoke about a couple of times on this. How do we get, and Paul and I have had this conversation, how do we get young people? And you would be really well placed to answer this or even come up with some some reasons why and some solutions. How can we get younger people? My daughter's in her early 30s, she's 32, my son's 28. How can we get younger, the younger generation interested and involved in politics? They don't have to be involved, but just interested, knowing who to vote for and why they're voting for them. It's a good question. You need to run younger candidates anyway for a start. Um, I felt I, I picked up a lot of younger votes this time round because people were looking at the election posters and but I was one of the youngest candidates by far in the area. And a lot of people in their 20s, 30s, even into their 40s had somebody finally they could resonate with and they could say, well, look, God, he's a, he's similar age to ourselves. He's going through similar problems. You know, I'm renting a house. I don't own a house at the minute. And how many hundreds of thousands of people in their 20s, 30s are in the same boat? So I do resonate with local, with younger people. 
So I think that's maybe why I got a, quite a substantial vote then. But to get them interested, you need to maybe run run younger candidates. They need to feel that, you know, being involved in politics will influence their lives or change their lives or help to shape their futures. And I just think that at the minute, younger people are so kind of obsessed with their own situation. You know, it let's we're going on holidays, we're going to college. We, they don't see the bigger picture that there's actually right. people in the background making decisions that have had a major impact on their lives and their situations. And I suppose volunteerism is dying a death in yeah. this country. To find yeah. anyone that will help you to do anything. You mm. talk to any clubs, GA clubs, soccer clubs, Kamoki clubs. People have volunteered out. Yeah. I think it, the problem is it was the same few people doing yeah. the work. Yeah, that's very true. And every club that I was involved in was the same. And every club that I can currently think of, it is the same six, seven, eight people doing all the work and they're totally burnt out. Yeah. And the younger people are not willing to come on board. I suppose they just don't see what the benefit of it, of it is for themselves. Are they disillusioned, do you think? Do you think of the younger generation disillusioned with politics, disillusioned with uh, the way things are, and um, di completely just disillusioned and don't know how to... I had a, 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 was talking to a neighbour, and she said that politi they don't feel politicians are listening to them. That's a good point, I suppose. Perhaps, definitely, at a national level, a lot of people are a little bit disillusioned, Um by different things that are going on. And that's why, you know, it will be interesting to see the general election going forward. But again, if younger people don't go out to vote, then yeah. there's still the same cohort of voters in their 40s, 50s, 60s, yeah. keep voting for the parties and nothing is going to change. And, yeah. um, you know, we just have to, you have to try and get them more community orientated and more involved. Yeah. And I suppose Great. maybe that stems back from the clubs they're involved in, that maybe a, an approach does have to be taken by some of the elder people on the committees to not to step aside, but to even bring on somebody as a yeah, yeah, great. Meant to them, meant yeah, to them. them. Yes, if you could spot someone in their early twenties, in the thirties, that might you might say, God, when they finish play their playing days, they'd make a great treasurer or a great secretary. And even if you only brought them on as the vice treasurer for a year or two, and then they could step into the role and yeah, a break, and the older people could come back and do the role later again. Mm. But it would, you know, regenerate the club. And lots of clubs are very good at doing that. But yeah, a lot of a lot of organisations are struggling badly to find volunteers, oh, yeah, to get yeah. younger people involved, and it's it's a major concern. And even. Mm. To find candidates to run in local elections and general yes. elections going forward, social media has a big thing to play in this, a big part to play. It's you're very accessible now if you're a public representative. Um, you're you're liable for online abuse. Um, there's no switch off button, and you know you would be worried going forward whether enough younger people will be interested in running in elections and volunteering in their communities. Yeah, it's 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 an interesting one as well. And even if you've been involved in a lot of committees and the executive level, uh, John, the amount of regulation and you know, um, governance that's involved in these jobs, it kind of it puts pe it puts people people off to as well. So I think that should be streamlined as well. You know, look, you need good governance, absolutely, but you know, you need to make it a bit more accessible and more streamlined for people too as well yes you have it has to be enjoyable and i'd say yeah. the, the enjoyment is being sucked out of a lot of things because the bureaucracy and the red tape and even applying for a grant for something small is mm. is an ordeal for people now and um things have gone too much too far down the line uh, of paperwork and regulations yeah and red tape very PC, everything is, you know, you have to watch what you do, watch what you say. Whereas, you know, a lot of the time, if you could just get the job done, it would be done a lot quicker. And 
you know, in a, in a nice sort of way. But yeah. it, it do you think then thing. that the, the county councils don't have the authority to answer or do work done? Does it have to go to Dublin? Does it have to go to Europe? So making it less um, accessible for local county councillors to um, deliver locally and TDs. Well, that's a very good point because a lot of um, a lot of what's happening in this country is now influenced in Europe. Um, a lot of our decisions are influenced in Brussels. That's why we do need a good level of representation as uh, out there in our MEPs. Um, there was some good MEPs elected the, the last time round, which was refreshing. Um, and there's some of them out there. I'm, I'm not sure what they're doing out there, but <laughs> that's the, that's the, they're, probably they're, there. saying, they're probably saying the same about their local county councillors. There's some of them there that uh, should be there and some of them that shouldn't, but they're there anyway. And they got elected. They got democratically elected to be there. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I have you know? huge respect for anyone that puts themselves forward for an election, no matter who they are, no matter what their background is. Um, it's a very difficult thing to do and to put yourself out there. You're setting yourself up for a major fall if it doesn't work out. Um, so, excuse me. Um, you know, I do have huge respect for anyone that runs for mm -hmm any type of election uh, public, public life yes public but, life. very difficult in, in modern yeah. life um, um we're coming up to the end of the hour but you have one more question you would like to yeah ask. I, I have a question it's very interesting you're also a peace, you're a peace commissioner as well john and i'm one as well so just show that i'm not bluffing there's my <laughs> very good. Uh, from the minister for justice um you're also a commissioner of votes and you became a commissioner of votes um, which is very interesting to me because I always thought you had to be a practicing solicitor, but there is a way around it which which I found which is which is quite genius, really. Um, yes, there is a way around it. If um, most commissioner for oaths are practicing solicitors and barristers, mm. Mm. but um, there if you can get six business people um, to sign, a, there's this paperwork, the, the petition. You can get the forms probably from your local solicitor. I think they, you might access them online. Um, you can get six business people to sign it um, and also six different solicitors or barristers. And then you can take that petition to the High Court in Dublin and the Chief Justice can decide upon it. Um, so you have to bring a barrister with you up there for the day. So it's a bit of an expense for the day. But um, look, it's a one-off day and a one-off fee. It's not the end of the world. But I, I found, you see, that I was being asked to sign a lot of forms that I couldn't. Mm. They needed a solicitor or a commissioner for oaths to sign. Yeah. And I kind of said, well, God, I'd like to help these people if I could, but I'm only a peace commissioner. Um, so I done my own research then and I looked into how does one become a commissioner for oaths um, if you're not a solicitor uh, or not a, a practicing member of, the, the law society and there is a way around it yeah it takes a little bit of an effort and a little bit of work but if you're able to find um the business people and the solicitors within your area to back it plus it takes pressure off the local solicitors too this yeah that's true. That's true. i'm going around as a public representative meeting hundreds of people every week I sign however many forms, a half a dozen every week or whatever it is. And yeah. maybe some weeks I might sign no form, but other weeks then you could sign 10. Um, but it yeah, takes very a little bit as well. Very important for people like, um, I know aff affidavits, which are, you know, are used and can be used in the court of law, but also things like um, if you're applying for paperwork for a mortgage, you need a, a commissioner of votes to sign that as well. Like, And that's that's a that's a massive, you know, um, piece of uh, piece of paper that needs to be signed, you know, and, and sometimes you know, it's actually like, quite hard to find these individuals because yeah. a lot of solicitors actually aren't commissioner for oaths. There's, yeah, I think in my mm. local town there might be one, maybe two, maybe two. So you know, you might not 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 excuse me, you might not always catch. The individual he might he might be gone to court in Dublin for two weeks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Or in a rush to find the commissioner for oaths. And well, I had that problem. Well, my daughter had that problem a couple of uh, a week before she went to Australia. She had to get a document signed by a commissioner of oaths in a panic, 
And that yeah. was on a Friday, and that had to, that was on a, a Thursday, Thursday afternoon. It needed to be done for the Monday. I I do get an awful lot of that, and yeah. I think that might have helped me in the election as well because. I was a peace commissioner for a number of years and then a commissioner for oaths for a number of years. And the amount of people I would have helped yeah. you know, on a late, late on a Sunday night, some college students, yeah. Might, yeah. Especially teachers, they might need a statutory declaration signed. Yeah. So they can go into work in a primary school on the Monday morning. Okay, yeah. I would have helped them and didn't charge them any fee or anything you know just yeah. happy to help them but yeah. for that when I was commissioner back, is not cannot charge it's a no, it's an honorary position but for a commissioner for oaths for you know for different things for some court documents or for anything yeah. um you know i just tried to help people as best as i could and they remembered that then when it came to the election yeah you know, People I'm, don't mind paying, you know. They yeah. people don't mind paying. Not every everybody doesn't want everything for for nothing. They don't mind making a donation, even if you don't charge. People don't mind making a donation with what they can afford, because as well, you know. So, but this is that's amazing, John. You know, we when we we heard about your election uh, win, we were very intrigued, weren't we, Paul? Paul told Absolutely. me about it. I saw it and I went, wow. I was like outside looking in, first time candidate, two and a half thousand votes. Yeah. Holy Moses. You know, um, but I don't know, from the interview, there's there's a lot of yeah, you know, that's that that wasn't an accident. No, it wasn't, I suppose. No, and the, the papers around here made headlines of it, you know, a big result and a big shock result to sell newspapers and to sell, but everyone on the ground knew that I'd say they knew I was on I was coming for a long time and um you know now in fairness we were all surprised by the vote myself mm -hmm. included well, I had my good. myself my dad had a little game before the election we both wrote down on a piece of paper how many votes we thought I'd get <laughs> he had in fairness he had me down for 1800 which I thought was a bit generous I said Jeannie God, yeah. I put myself down for around 1350 to 1400 um yeah. I thought I'd probably fall short of a quota and need whoever would tap the pole to to um, yeah. you know. I had just I assumed I'd do well maybe in my local areas, but then yeah. there were other areas that rode in behind me big time, which I wasn't fully counting on, and I would have tapped the pole in some. I said before the election, had you been given, we'll give you the seven seats. You said absolutely, take your hand no, off. I and was on. only looking for. I said it before the election. I'm looking for the sixth or seventh seat, and yeah. great if I get in, great, and if I don't, well, it won't be from a lack of an effort anyway. Were you over the line? Were you the first ca uh, candidate over the line? I was. I knew at twelve <laughs> half eleven that morning. I think that every box that had opened, we were doing well in. So, but they didn't announce it till midnight that night. Oh. Um, I didn't go to the count centre. I left my little campaign team to go there and um, I went over. Your little campaign, ca campaign team. 104 people campaign yeah. Plus well, yeah. family, plus family. Well, I, had, uh, I had a very specific team for the count centre. I picked <laughs> three individuals who were very good with figures and numbers and I asked them, and actually, you know, you know, that was their job in the whole campaign that they gave me that day. You know that they went over that day specifically to look. Tally at the, I love the count sector. Yeah, so yeah. it was very much a learning curve. I didn't have, I never ran a campaign in my life, um, but I think I put together a very competitive campaign, and oh, got a, there, was a, there was a joke there locally at, um, a few weeks ago. They said, "Genie, God, if you were in America, uh, Biden or Trump would be paying you big money to run their campaign." You know, so. <laughs> or someone like that so yeah. maybe that's something for the future maybe if oh, I ever got you never, know. You never know I could be a campaign manager for somebody maybe you never know. You never know. <laughs> John we've thoroughly enjoyed having you on and chatting to you um it's been really enjoyable from from me personally and I know from Paul I can see from Paul really enjoyed chatting to you and I'm sure like the viewers would really enjoy getting to know you and um and congratulating you on your success and and really listening to a politician who is voted by the people who who works for the people and is political influenced by the people and I think that's something very refreshing Thank you very much, Roisin and Paul, for having me on. I'm delighted. It was a very enjoyable chat and 
perhaps I can come back on again soon. With Love to have you on. We we sincerely hope that um you'd consider running for running the New South Tipperary cons constituency because you'd you'd make a su a super TD for the area. Oh, oh now you're not allowed to be biased. <laughs> ah. <laughs> We'd love to have you on and I'd love to have you running and love to hear your 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 campaign and your your campaign uh, policies and uh and issues uh, that you're gonna run for. And if you any issues, John, that you would like anything, even if it's only a five minute, ten minute video that you would like to get the message out to your your constituents or out onto the internet do get in touch with us. We're just a phone call away and we'd be happy to have you on and put out uh, even a, from a 5, 10, 15, 20 to an hour video of anything that you would like to get your message out for. That's great. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Uh, we'll talk to you both again soon. Absolutely. Oh, you Thanks definitely for... will. Thanks for coming on, John. Thank okay. you so much indeed. Right. And John, how, just before we leave, how can people get in touch with you? Oh. Um, I'm very active on social media, I suppose. That was another trump card. I had been very involved with uh, writing for local newspapers, promoting businesses for years as well. So I'm on Facebook. I've Councillor John O'Heaney, Commissioner for Oats is the name of the page. Uh, I'm on Instagram. I think the handle is vote John O'Heaney number one. So I had that uh, popping up in front of people. Um, that worked. That worked as well. So Facebook, Instagram. I'm now on TikTok as well. Oh. It's a lot of the younger people in their 20s they're and 30s on TikTok. Have, have deviated away from Facebook and they're kind of on Instagram and TikTok. I'm on Twitter, but I'm more more to follow the sports updates on Twitter. I don't really post too much, but mainly um, um those three anyway, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Um, I have a mobile phone number that's very accessible as well. And an email address, if my council email address is john.ohini at counselor, um, dot tipperary .co .ie. So if anyone ever wants to, to send me an email with any issues, I'd be happy to try and resolve them. And will you send me those, um, send me those in an email and I'll put them in the description box below. I will. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, Councillor John uh, uh, P. O'Heaney, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to Paul and I on the Irish Political Roundup. Bye.